they actually say that only a third as many people come the Sunday after Easter, or Easter Day, as come on Easter. And our lilies have, have already been clipped. How do we keep that spirit, that Easter joy that seemed so palpable a week ago in our hearts? How do we trust? How do we make it our claim? How do we make Alleluia our song? How do we live a resurrected life? It's not easy. We have last week's gospel, the incredible, miraculous gospel of the tomb being found empty, and it is filled with joy. But somehow it collides against so much of our weekly ins and outs. That many of us didn't get there that moment they found the tomb empty. In fact, Jesus' closest friends didn't get there to being Easter people the moment they found the tomb empty. And for a lot of reasons, I think today's gospel speaks more about how we encounter Easter, how we grow into Easter than last week's miraculous discovery that the tomb was empty. We find the disciples having heard word that Jesus was alive, but not trusting it, not setting their life upon it, hiding out for fear of the Jews. Really, they were hiding out for fear of a lot of things, for fear that Jesus might actually be alive, and they might have to give an account for those last days where they were scarcely to be seen. That Jesus wasn't alive, but somebody had, had, had taken uh, a tomb raider, had taken his body, and now Rome and the Jews would want to find out who it was. They'd want to stomp it out. Seeing what a, a, a hoo-ha they made over Lazarus being raised, they would want to squell this as fastly as, as possible. And the first people they'd go looking for were the disciples. So they were hiding out for all these reasons, filled with shame, filled with fear, filled with unknowing. What does this mean? If Jesus is alive, what does that mean? What did Jesus teach us about that? What does our life look like? They're probably going through their notes wondering, who was the recording secretary? I sure hope it wasn't Judas. Who's got all the notes on what we were supposed to remember from Jesus when he comes back to life? What did he promise? What did he ask of us? There was something about taking up our own cross, about denying ourselves, about being able to put God ahead of family and life and security. What was promised? What was asked? Are we up for trembling behind those locked doors. And then Jesus appears to them. And don't picture Jesus as this placid uh, uh, spiritual being, but picture the Jesus that looked when he was nailed to the cross, looked for his closest friends, saw the women who had traveled with him, the women who had who'd given him, uh, him life, the women who had, had been there, uh, but saw very few of the, of the disciples, his closest friends. The Jesus that wanted them to stay awake during his darkest hour, that wanted to look out and see eyes that met love with love instead of love with fear and anger. Picture that Jesus that had to work towards those first words that he offered to his disciples. Peace. Peace I give to you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Reconciling peace Peace that is the absolute opposite thing of what's roaring in your heart and in your inside gut today. The opposite of that I give you, peace. Not an easy peace, not a peace that comes easily from my lips, but a peace that's given out of love, a reconciling and forgiving peace. The first thing he says to them, peace be with you. And they begin to trust. And they begin to realize that they are redeemed, that they are loved beyond anything that they can do to break that love, and that that love is more powerful than even the grave. And they walk out from that room as God has breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, ready for ministry. And you know the first task that they've been given, the first gift they've been given, the thing that is most godly, it's not the power to walk on water, not even the power to turn uh, fish and bread into, uh, into plenty, or water into wine, or to heal. It's the gift to forgive. Remember, that's what gets Jesus in, 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 in trouble early on. Uh, he even thinks that he can forgive sins. Only God can do that. They understood back then that forgiveness 
is what binds us and unbinds us as much as just about anything. Our sense of unworthiness, our sense of guilt, our sense of, of, of having messed up and, and, and not being able to start over. He breathes God's spirit on them, and as they breathe it in, he gives them the power to forgive. And in that, the feeling of what it is to be forgiven. So that's the first thing. And then they go out and they share the good news with Thomas, who wasn't in there. And Thomas is one of the boldest disciples. And he always gets a bum rap on this day, doubting Thomas Sunday, low Sunday. But he's bold and he's brave. And he's the one who said, let's go to Bethany, even if it means dying. And let me die right there with you, Jesus. And he wasn't locked up. But the fact that Jesus might be alive, the truth that this might be true, was going to change Thomas's life going to change every footstep from that moment on and what he did with his life and he needed to be sure not that he didn't trust the 10 but when you're going to give your life over to something when you're going to be so transformed by a truth you need to know deep down in your gut that it's real and so he wanted to see it's not far from the rest of us if we're going to give our lives over to something if we're going to be transformed by something we need to have an encounter that transforms us we can, we can coast in someone else's shadow, somebody who has a faith that seems big enough for both of us, but at some point, we need to own it ourselves. And that's what Thomas begged for. The same thing the disciples got. And Thomas says, until I see the wounds myself, I can't believe, I can't trust, I can't give this as my entire foundation. And so Jesus appears to him. He sees the hands, the hands that washed his feet, the hands that fed him the bread of life, the hands that touched him, the hands he watched transform lives, give people hope, remind people that they were a beloved child of God when no one else would remind them. Hands that touched broken hearts and broken places and broken limbs and broken spirits. And he saw the brokenness of those hands poured out for him. He didn't need to touch anymore. He believed. Trusted that truth. And I don't think Jesus is criticizing or condemning him. I think Jesus is inviting the rest of us in. He says, how blessed are all of you who don't have this experience. Who know me through this powerful story and all the stories like it. Who know me through prayer. Who know me through that feeling in your heart that there has got to be a God who loves me and has redeemed me and given his life over for me. That's how blessed are those people trust, who make this their foundation without any assurances. And we're brought into the story. But I do think Thomas reveals another truth, that in our desire to seek understanding, in our desire to touch God's wounds, in our desire to know God, there is more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. Tennyson says, says that. And I think there's a truth one of the great things, as we get ready to baptize Lily, we pray for her to be a doubting Thomas. We pray for her to have that desire to seek deeper understanding. We ask God to give her an inquiring and discerning heart to seek something beyond what's right in front of her. Because when we get there, we can make it our foundation. We can step towards transformation. We can walk out of here and unbind the sins of others and truly forgive because we know deep in our hearts that we've been forgiven, that we've been loved. So I invite all of us to revisit our baptism, to have an inquiring and discerning heart, to challenge Easter, to scrape beneath the surface, to stomp a little harder to make sure that foundation holds. Because then, then with a little more boldness, each time we scratch, each time we pound our feet, we can more boldly say, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.